So I'll try to start by giving the motivation So these are numbers that are very abstractly defined. Uh, in order to explain the uh, whole picture, first I'll start with the more classical stuff. And then gradually I'll move on to more complicated things. And uh, I'll state the main result at the end. So multi-zeta values, the classical version of the periodic multi-zeta values are the ordinary multi-zeta values without the periodic uh, adjective. These were defined by, originally by uh, Euler more than 200 years ago. So the definition is that zeta S1 up to SK is defined to be 1 over N1 to the S1 up to times N2 to the S2 dot 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 NK to the SK such that uh, 0 is less than N1 is less than N2 less than NK and here we assume that SI's S1 up to SK are all uh, positive integers and we also assume that the last one is strictly greater than 1. This is to just to ensure convergence. Otherwise it will not converge. So uh, it's a bit mysterious because uh, no one at this point really knows why Euler defined these numbers. So, uh, But they were recently rediscovered by uh, Sagier in his work in number theory, by Ekal in his work in uh, holomorphic dynamics, by Broadhurst and Kramer in their work in quantum field theory. So it's very strange that these numbers appeared again in the early uh, 1990s by in various different subjects at the same time. So uh, if we look at the Q space spanned by these numbers, they form an algebra. Uh, let's say denoted by uh, M Z V. So uh, if you the, the the thing is that if you multiply two multi zeta numbers, their product can be expressed as a linear combination of other multi zeta values. And if we we call the weight of this multi zeta value uh, the sum of these integers, SIs. So there are uh, many, many interesting questions uh, about these multi-zeta values, and most of them are extremely difficult. So one question, for example, is that if you look at the algebra of all multi-zeta values over Q, then uh, the question is that expectation is that uh, this decomposes as a direct sum of multi-zeta values of weight n. Wait. Already this is an extremely difficult question because as you can uh, immediately see, 
uh, this immediately implies the uh, transcendence of all the zeta values, which is unknown. We all only know the transcendence of a couple of uh, zeta values other than the even integers. So this is already already implies a transcendence result. So, I mean, the, uh, maybe the most uh, trivial remark is that if k is equal to 1, these are the values of the ordinary uh, zeta function at integers. So, in order to uh, give you an example so th of the relations between multi-zeta values, there are many, many relations between multi-zeta values. If you take, for example, two uh, zeta values and multiply them, what you get is that this is equal to zeta nm plus zeta mn plus zeta m plus n. And you can find uh, many relations such as these ones. And uh, the thing is that uh, you want to, another question about, another open question about these classical uh, values is that if you let dn to be the dimension of this vector space of the weight n multi zeta values, the conjecture is that due to Zagier is that if you look at the generating function dn uh, t to the n and greater than or equal to zero uh, this is given by 1 over 1 minus t squared minus t cubed so one can start uh, one can wonder why one has such a uh, formula so this is uh, related so motivation to this comes from uh, related to the rank of the uh, k groups of integers. So uh, this rank is equal to 1. So let's suppose that n is greater than uh, 0. This rank is 1 if n is of the form 4k plus 1. It is equal to 0 otherwise. So this suggests that uh, there is some deeper structure in this algebra. So one can look at these numbers naively and try to prove transcendence results uh, explicitly about them. But it turns out to be not manageable. Even though they seem explicit, uh, proving things about these, proving transcendence about these things explicitly turns out to be a difficult thing. So we'll try to first, uh, I'll try to first explain what this deeper structure about these numbers are. And then once we do that, we'll try to look at the periodic analog. So the, the starting point of the uh, of the deeper structure is to express multi zeta values as, as periods. So what is what are these? So first look at let's look at the uh, following definition. So if uh, omega i uh, one up to i to n are uh, one forms on on a manifold M, then we express this uh, symbol, and let's let alpha from zero one to M be a path 
on this manifold, then by this notation, we mean the following integral. So we take uh, omega 1 alpha t1 wedge omega n alpha tn with the constraint that uh, t1 is less than or equal to t2 and so on. If you want, you can think of it as that first you find an antiderivative of omega 1 and multiply it with omega 2, find the antiderivative of that, multiply it with omega 3 and go on like, like this. So with this definition, these uh, multi-zeta values can be expressed in the following form. So this is a formula by Kontsevich. So uh, if you take uh, d log 1 minus c and then take d log z everywhere where the total number of factors here, k1 is k1. So you take 1 d log 1 minus c and k1 minus 1 times d log z and then repeat the same thing. d log 1 minus c and then take d log z and then d log z k2 times k2 factors. And then finally, keep on doing this, d log z, d log z. And this is k, ah sorry, this is s1 factors, this is s2 factors, and this is sk factors. Then what you get is that this is minus 1 to the k times the multi zeta value zeta s1 up to sk. So uh, what does this mean? Uh, so you, we, are we are expressing this number which is given in terms of a series by, a, uh, by an integration of rational forms over a domain which is rational. So if you express this thing in terms of uh, the right part, you see that you are uh, taking a form uh, which, ha uh, which is, S, uh, which, is uh, which has variables equal to the weight of this multi zeta value and then you're integrating over a domain which is given by polynomial equations. So we call such things uh, periods. So let me try to uh, write that. So uh, a period uh, due to, again, Konsevich and Zagier, Uh, a, a period, let me say, effective effective period is a complex number whose real and imaginary parts Uh, can be written as an integral of a, a rational form uh, 
so this is important with Q coefficients, with coefficients that are rational numbers. So there are two rationals here, which mean uh, different things. A rational form is a uh, is an M form, which can be written as a polynomial divided by another polynomial, and then some dx1 up to dxn uh, on Rn. And this rational refers to the coefficients of these polynomials. It this Q coefficients means that these polynomials are given by uh, th their coefficients are inside Q. So it's a division of two polynomials whose coefficients are defined over Q uh, over a domain. So we're integrating a rational form with Q coefficients over a domain in uh, Rn for some n. Uh, which is given by polynomial equations by polynomial inequalities, sorry. Here again, uh, the polynomials again have Q coefficients. Such as this picture. If you look at the domain, it's given by polynomial inequalities, namely t1, t2, tn, and they all have uh, q coefficients. So such numbers are called uh, periods, so, and they form a ring. Let's say p denote the uh, ring of periods. It might not be immediately clear that they form a ring, but they do uh, form a ring. So, uh, so what's the use of thinking about, these, uh, about this ring? So first of all, the Konsevich uh, formula shows that this guy is inside this period ring. So the usefulness of this ring is as follows. So first of all, uh, when you think about it, uh, we first start with integers in number theory, and then we extend it to Q, and then not every polynomial has a solution here, so we extend it to Q bar and go on, and then uh, we, uh, we complete it, and then we go to complex numbers. The thing is that... Uh, with real numbers, if you want to do, when you do number theory, you might end up with two numbers, and you might want to check whether they are equal or not. So in general, given two real numbers, it is impossible to check whether they are the same or not. It is not possible to check whether they are the same. What do I mean by this? Uh, what I mean is the following. So if you think about two real numbers, they are given by their decimal expansion. And then to check that whether they are the same or not, you have to check each decimal place, but that's an infinite number of operations. So if you're given two numbers, they might, for example, if you look at pi times, uh, let's say, square root of 163 divided by 3, and then if you look at log of uh, 64,320, it turns out that the first 15 digits are the same. <laughs> but they are not equal to each other. So you might end up with situations like this. You might check 
first hundred digits, mm -hmm. they might look like the same, but they might be completely different. So, what does periods do? So, the thing is that, if you're doing number theory, you're not interested in most of the real numbers. So you're doing analysis, you need all the real numbers. But if you're <laughs> doing number theory, uh, you might not need all the real numbers. The real numbers that you get uh, in number theory, all of them are more or less, all of the interesting ones are periods. So these periods is a much smaller ring, much, much smaller ring than complex numbers. So it sits between Q bar and C. So you can show that every algebraic number is a period. So this is a ring that's much smaller. So first of all, this is countable. Uh, and it contains all, all the things, all the algebraic numbers, and much more. And uh, the expectation is that uh, if you believe all the general uh, conjectures about uh, algebraic geometry, uh, you can study this thing using group theoretic methods. So the idea is that conjecturally, uh, one, let me say it like this, one expects to study this ring this thing uh, using this object using uh, I put it in quotation marks, marks group theoretic tools if you know more fancy algebraic geometry, what, what I mean is the Tanakin formalism. Tanakin methods. So I'll talk about this a little more. So uh, this is a much, much uh, smaller ring than this one. And in principle, uh, given two periods, uh, you can expect to determine whether they are the same or not. So there is a deep conjecture of Grothendieck which says that if you're given two periods, uh, if they are the same, write them as integrals, write two of them as integrals, and apply basic calculus methods such as uh, change of variables formula and then uh, and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Using the, these methods, you can go from one of them to the other one. If you can, cannot go from one of them to the other one using the basic tools of calculus, then they, they are not the same. So in principle, uh, it solves this problem. Uh, this idea of Grothendieck solves uh, this problem. Of course, it's a, if, if it is unproved at this point, and probably it will be unproved for a, a very long time. But in principle, uh, it gives one motivation to think about uh, this ring. So, um, so what do I mean by what? So why is this uh, group theoretic uh, tool so useful? So let me illustrate this thing in a very basic uh, example, which we know uh, from, let's say, Galois theory. So, in some sense, uh, what? A, I'm going to be talking about is a generalization of Galois theory uh, to the case of transcendental numbers. So one can think of this uh, uh, period ring P uh, and the group theoretic method uh, similar to the situation over Q bar and the Galois theory. So for example, this is a question that, that I always ask in my uh, algebra course, graduate algebra course. course. For example, uh, if you want to show that uh, cube root 2 cannot be written uh, as uh, a rational function with Q coefficients, uh, 
uh, of roots of unity. So by dollar theory and group theoretic arguments, you can uh, immediately show that. So if if this thing, if you could write this thing as as a rational function with q coefficients of roots of unity, then cube root two would be inside the uh, let's say n cyclotomic field if you choose n sufficiently divisible. But in that situation, what will you have? The splitting field of this will be contained inside this, so you would have a map from Q zeta n, Q Gala group of this, surjecting to the Gala group of the splitting field of this, which is Q cube root of 2 together with a root of, third root of unity. But the Gala group here is S3, and the Galois group here is Z mod N star. But this is abelian, and this is not. So the main idea is that you can employ techniques like this to determine transcendence results. And of course, it's, a, it's going to be much, much more difficult than this situation. So now before going to the periodic version, we have to express these periods in a different way. By the way, if there are any questions, please stop me. So, we're going to rephrase this ring of periods. So, namely, uh, so this is an alternative definition. It's not immediately clear that they are the same, but it is not too difficult either. So, uh, a number is a period if uh, a number alpha is a period if alpha is equal to uh, let's say omega and uh, the integral of omega over c such that omega such that uh, we have the following situation x over q bar is a smooth quasi-projective variety So if you don't know what this means, this means the following. X is given by the solution of uh, homogeneous polynomials in n variables, let's say, over some projective space. And the polynomials have coefficients inside Q bar. But that might not be all of X. You might need to divide. Uh, you might need to uh, get rid of certain other solutions. Uh, so if, if I didn't have quasi-projective, then x would be given as a solution of polynomials. And uh, since it's quasi-projective, uh, I might need to uh, subtract the solutions of uh, more polynomials uh, over that uh, variety. So, and uh, x is a smooth quasi-projective variety. Why is some uh, closed sub-variety again defined over over Q bar and then uh, omega 
is a closed n form on on x uh, such that it vanishes on y and c is a singular n chain such that uh, its boundary lies inside c uh, lies inside y sorry so omega restricted to y is zero and the boundary of uh, c itself might not be closed but its boundary lies inside y and uh, if you have such a picture and if you look at the evaluation of this uh, n form over the c uh, and if you can write alpha in terms of such an object then it's a period so th if you these two definitions are equal yes um, are you actually embedding this q by inside of r so they give us follows it from the ah uh, yes 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 uh, yes thank you yes so this together with an embedding sigma into c otherwise as you said this this would not make sense for any embedding yes thank you <laughs> So, uh, so this suggests that uh, periods, so this suggests that periods come from uh, comparison theorems between cohomologies. So on the one hand, so you can think of integration as a comparison of uh, Durham and Betty cohomology. So let me try to uh, say it. So suppose, uh, let's say in this case we don't need to assume that uh, our variety is defined over Q bar. Suppose that uh, X is a smooth quasi-projective variety over C uh, just like you have the uh, Durham cohomology for uh, differential uh, manifolds you have Durham cohomology in the algebraic case so you again compute it using uh, using forms but of course you only allow algebraic forms and uh, and then on the other hand uh, now since this is defined over C you can look at its complex topology and then it has a, a Betty cohomology which is uh, in general called singular cohomology in calculus so this is the same as singular cohomology so you have the singular cohomology of the uh, underlying uh, complex space. So you forget all the algebraic structure and you look at it very naively. So the, the magic is that uh, these things are isomorphic. So this is a, this, uh, so you have the same version of this for differentiable manifolds, but in the algebraic case, this is a much, much more difficult theorem due to Grothendieck, which is in some sense the start of all of this story. So, uh, but the thing is that if your variety is defined over Q, then this is a Q structure. Q structure if uh, X is defined over Q. Namely, uh, if X is defined over Q, you can take only the uh, forms which are defined over Q and compute the cohomology and then get the answer and then transfer the answer with C. It turns out that they are the same. So this is compatible with base change. On the other hand, this always has a Q structure. Namely, you just take Q coefficients. And these two Q structures are not related at all. In one of them, you change the coefficient. In the other case, you look at the polynomial defining the thing. 
uh, which are defined over Q. So these, in general, have nothing to do with each other. And th let me say one more thing. This comparison is given by integration. So it's a completely not algebraic operation. So uh, if you think of uh, cohomo Betty cohomology as uh, linear functionals on uh, singular homology, then what you do is that you take a chain here and you take a form and pair it with each other. So uh, now if you look at the, how this, these two Q structures relate to each other in terms of this map, the, these actually are the things that give you the periods. So the comparison of these two Q structures is what you give the, what give you the periods. So one can make this more explicit, but uh, then I will not have time to talk about the periodic situation. So let me say a few words about the periodic case. So uh, this comparison theorem can be extended to the linear, more linear category that's obtained by varieties, which are called motives, and then uh, the, this, this comparison can be generalized to that situation. But before going to that, let me say a few words about the periodic case. So the periodic multi-zeta values will be coming from a periodic version of this comparison theorem. And actually, maybe before that, uh, let me make this remark. Uh, what does this have to do with uh, the multi-zeta values that we started with. So remember that we wrote that uh, we wrote these multi-zeta values as periods. So it turns out that uh, as I said this uh, comparison theorem can be extended to the category of motives and there is a very natural uh, motive which is the fundamental group of uh, projective line minus three points. So if you take gm subtract 1 and then uh, you look at a certain base point and then this gives you a motive. So let me try to explain what I mean by this. So uh, if you uh, So uh, you want a linear category, uh, so the thing is that if you want to study algebraic varieties, they are very rigid objects. You want some kind of a linear category so that you embed your algebraic varieties and study algebraic varieties using linear algebra. So the idea of doing that is to enlarge the category and uh, look at the category of motives. So, uh, so one, uh, so if if you have, for example, any, let's say, uh, variety over, uh, let's say, Q bar, then you can look at the uh, fundamental group of of its, uh, let's say, let's look at it over C. If you have something over C, then you can look at it, the underlying fundamental group of the underlying topological space, let's say, at a base point. So the, the, this is the usual topological fundamental group. So this is, uh, so for example, if you looked at the uh, homology of this object, they would give you motives. But if you look at the fundamental group, it turns out that this is not motivic. In other words, you cannot express the full uh, topological fundamental group ju uh, just using uh, algebraic cycles, for example. But there is a version of the fundamental group, uh, which is the unipotent completion of that. So it is... Uh, I cannot go into detail of this, uh, but uh, 
one one way to describe this is that the, if you t take the underlying uh, topological group and then uh, apply the Malsev completion, which is which is a, a way of making a, a uniquely divisible torsion-free nilpotent group out of that, then there is an algebraic group that uh, you can associate to that object. And it captures part of this topological group. So the thing is that that object is of motivic origin. So it can be expressed in terms of algebraic cycles. So now, if you apply this uh, gadget to projective line minus three points, so GM in this case is the multiplicative group, so it's uh, complex numbers except zero, so, and then you delete one, so you're looking at complex numbers except zero and one. So if you take this object and look at its fundamental group, of course it is, if you look at the topological fundamental group, it is completely trivial. It's a free group on two generators. But uh, if you look at the motivic fundamental group, it turns out to be an extremely rich object. Uh, in the sense that it gives you a motive, but then there is one more thing. Uh, we have to remember that we have to choose a base point when we deal with uh, fundamental groups. And in this case, it is uh, extremely important to choose a right base point, And we choose a so-called tangential base point at zero. If we do that, we get a, not only we get a motive, we get a motive which has good reduction modulo all primes. So pi 1 uh, gm minus 1 t0 1 is a motive with good reduction over z. So then if you repl uh, apply this uh, comparison theorem, the numbers that you get are periods of this motive. So multi zeta values are uh, periods of this motive. And uh, periodic multi zeta values are going to be the periodic periods of this motive. So uh, the thing is that uh, there are very basic motives which are called Tate motives. And if you look at the iterated extensions of these Tate motives, they are called mixed Tate motives. And it turns out that this object uh, generates the category of mixed state motives. So once you understand the uh, periods of this motive, then you understand the periods of all mixed state motives. So due to a theorem of, uh, recent theorem of uh, Francis Brown, uh, implies that all periods of uh, mixed state motives over Z over Z come from from the uh, fundamental group of projective line minus three points. So what I want to say is that even though this object looks like a very special object, it generates the whole category of mixed state motives over Z. The thing is that uh, if, you're not, if you're not even interested in mixed state motives over Z, if you're gener generally interested in just motives over Z, there are not many examples. So in general, it's difficult to find an example of a motive over Z. It's difficult to find something that has good reduction everywhere. So periodic multi zeta values are going to be periodic, uh, periodic periods of this. So all the periodic periods of mixed state motives over Z are going to be combinations of periodic multi zeta values. So now let me try to talk about the periodic case. So what's a periodic number? So fix a prime.
if we fix a prime, then uh, there is a natural absolute value on Z defined as follows. This is the periodic absolute value. This is equal to uh, P to the minus K, where A and B are inside Z and uh, they are relatively prime to P. So in other words, uh, as if uh, the ab uh, absolute value of P is 1 over P. So this defines a absolute value on P and if you complete Q with respect to this absolute value then you get a field QP. So it's if you take Q and of course if you complete it with respect to the usual absolute value you get R. So this is an analog of R. But uh, generally in undergraduate we only see real numbers so you, we are missing a large part of the uh, real world. We call it the real world but there is also the periodic world. So whatever you do in real numbers you do in periodic numbers. Now let me illustrate, uh, let me say a few words about why this is so important. So if you want to understand Q, uh, so one importance is more philosophical, it's Ostrowski's theorem. It says that if you have any non-trivial absolute value on Q is equivalent to uh, either the usual absolute value or some periodic absolute value for some P. Another one is maybe even more important is the product theorem. This is an analog of the fact that if you have a rational function, its numbers, number of poles and zeros are the same. So it tells, that, it tells you that if you have any number, uh, rational number, and if you take the uh, product of all, uh, all its periodic absolute values, and multiply it with its usual absolute value, then you get one. So if you're just looking at the real absolute value, you're missing a very fundamental thing about your, uh, about your number. It's like looking at your function at only one place and ignoring all the periodic ones. So I have to be very fast. So, um, so the thing is that uh, with the periodic, if you have a, if you have the, co if you're looking at the cohomology of your algebraic variety over Q, it has many different cohomology theories. So I described only two cohomology th theories over there: Durham cohomology and Singler cohomology. But there is lots other more. So you can look at the Durham cohomology. And you can look at the Betty cohomology, which is called the Singler cohomology. You can look at the et al cohomology with certain coefficients. And you can look at the crystalline cohomology, which is some kind of a Doram cohomology of the reduction of your curve modulo sum prime. Uh, and there are various different relationships between these cohomology theories. Maybe the deepest one for uh, number theory is to pass between crystalline cohomology together with some other structures coming from the Hodge filtration, etc., plus Hodge filtration and some other information, and uh, to pass between et al. cohomology and the crystalline cohomology. So this comparison gives us uh, lots of important information that we can use in number theory. So 
this crystalline cohomology in itself carries lots of information and uh, the comparison of crystalline cohomology with Doran cohomology is what's going to give us the periodic multi zeta values. So, so if we apply this uh, situation to uh, again the fundamental group of projective line minus three points we get the following situation so that was four five so uh, the crystalline cohomology uh, theory has a Frobenius action uh, which is its main object actually so uh, there is uh, a star action on uh, projective line minus three points fundamental group of this and uh, if we take this picture with the tangential base points at 0 and 1 we can define the following object uh, the thing is that in the the ramp path there is a canonical path between these base points between this base point and this one and then if we apply the crystalline Frobenius uh, to that object and come back with the inverse of this Doran path then of course we get a we get an element inside the fundamental group of the of our object in fact a QP valued point of that but then uh, the QP valued of uh, points of this uh, algebraic group is very easy to describe just like the fact that uh, the fundamental group of this thing ordinary fundamental group is the free group on two generators uh, this is in some sense a free group on two generators uh, which corresponds to in some sense paths over 0 and 1 so E0 and E1 could be thought of a Lie version of paths around 0 and 1 so this gives us a canonical element inside here Let, so let's call this element G so the definition due to uh, Delin is that uh, if you look at the coefficient of E0 S1 minus 1 E1 dot 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 E0 SK minus 1 E1 this is exactly the periodic analog of what we started with so uh, this is a completely abstract definition uh, this was defined in around 2002 and so on but uh, there was no formula for these values so it is a completely abstract thing so in the remember in the beginning we started with an explicit thing and made it very complicated and then uh, made it more formal and applied the same thing to the periodic machinery and we got these numbers and what are the question is what are these numbers if you want to prove transcendence results of these numbers you want to get a handle about what they are since I have only two minutes let me tell you the answer so uh, there are some uh, partial series so let me write sigma s bar m bar n which is these things 1 and 1 to the s1 
up to and k to the sk 0 and 1 up to and k and less than n so it's a partial sum where ni minus mi is divisible by p so these are highly divergent so divergent in uh, qp with respect to the topology of qp but the thing is that there are even more divergent objects than these ones but they are more canonical if you write these objects in terms of these uh, highly divergent objects linear combination of highly divergent ob objects except and then some constant uh, sorry there is let me write it like this there is only there is one convergent object plus highly divergent objects you can write it as a linear combination of these canonical ones and these are canonical and if you take the limit of this then you get some number so th and then uh, this this process is, could be thought of as a periodic regular regularization so from these objects you get uh, certain periodic numbers and then uh, it turns out that uh, they form an algebra so let's call uh, I have to be finish in one minute uh, let let P denote uh, this is not the same P as the periods maybe I should say uh, I let I denote the algebra of the regularized values uh, the theorem is that uh, all the uh, periodic multi zeta values uh, are inside this I IPs and the inclusion is explicit so we can write uh, every uh, periodic multi zeta value in terms of these numbers so you can think of the, these as the analogs the regularizations of these as the analogs of the periodic analogs of the series that we began with and uh, yeah let me stop here because I already am one minute late